Hello and welcome to another My Life in Film. This year we're looking at 1983. I was 10 years old in this year and the, the, the range of films that came out, there was a good mix of good, bad and purely dreadful. Let's get to it. So, 1983 in film. What films stuck with me through my life at various points? Let's start off before we get to the short list of the key films in my life with our usual look at what was the top ten for that year at the US box office. So at the top you can see we've got Return of the Jedi. We've got Terms of Endearment, Flashdance, Trading Places, War Games, Octopussy, Sudden Impact, Staying Alive, Mr. Mom and Risky Business. There's quite a few in that list that I've not actually seen. We'll get to them at the end. 1983 was the year that saw more films than ever get an R rating uh, up until that year so far, as the world of movies was was getting more adult in content. And I don't mean in a, in a um, blue movie erotic kind of way. I just mean in horrors and shockers and thrillers kind of way. Also, at the Oscars that year, Terms of Endearment was the standout winner, uh, sweeping the boards on quite a few categories. Anyway, let's get to the important bit. These are the films that meant something to me. So, a few quick films of note from that year. Things that maybe I've seen a few times, or maybe I've only seen once, but I have a, diff a slight memory of. We'll start with BMX Bandits, by no means a good film from what my memory serves. I saw this in my, well, when it came out on VHS about a year later, so it must have been about 11 or 12. It was Nicole Kidman's first film, and that's probably the most notable thing about it. But it was a film that was cashing in on the current fascination with BMX biking. BMXers were everywhere. Everyone wanted one with padding all around everywhere that you could get so they could do bunny hops and pogoing and yay. And so why not make a film about a group of kids who uncover a bunch of radios and find out that there's a criminal gang who are planning a bank robbery and using the radios to tap into the police frequencies so they can monitor the police traffic. It, it, this was basically a big screen, <laughs> a, a big screen style red hand gang thing. And if you don't know what the red, red hand gang is, you've missed out on a treat. It was awful. Uh, even even back when I was a kid, I knew it wasn't that good. But it's notable, like I say, for Nicole Kidman's first outing. Now, Educating Rita. Educating Rita is a film that I want to go back and revisit at some point in my life, because I've seen it twice. Once when I was in my early teens and once when I was at university, and that's about it. And I remember actually finding it quite an enjoyable little outing. Uh, Julie Walters plays a mid-twenties married hair stylist who decides to go back and f fill her education. And there she meets the professor played by Michael Caine, and he sees the potential within her and makes her... Makes her a better person than what she was when she started. It's a great little film, it's a charming film, and Julie Walters, straight out the gate, absolutely magnificent. She's always been quite a presence on screen, and in this film, she truly shines. Like I say, one that I want to go back and revisit at some point. One film that I don't want to revisit, even though I'm currently going through the Bond collection, and I'm not looking forward to getting around to this. Octopussy came out this year. Possibly... No, definitely Roger Moore's worst outing as far as I'm concerned. It's a dreadful film. Even when I was a kid and I watched this, I knew it was a bad Bond film. Bad Bond. Bad Bond. Uh, however, it wasn't as bad as the other bad Bond film that came out this year, which was Sean Connery in Never Say Never Again. I saw this whilst on holiday. Uh, uh, it, was, it was probably at a Butlins and they put on free films for anyone who went to watch them and there was three of us sat in the screen watching it and it was terrible it was terrible and i've re-watched it in recent years and it's it's really bad this never say never again actually makes octopussy look like a high point of the bond films so you know swings and roundabouts for action and adventure in my mid-teens i latched onto the hong kong action films of jackie chan 
and this was the year that Project A came out, which I didn't see until I was about 15, 16. But it, this became one of my favourites of his early canon. It was typically acrobatic martial arts fun, uh, of which Jackie Chan was notorious for. And the, it was a, a fun-packed aquatic adventure. Well worth checking out. If you've never seen Project A, I'd put it alongside his police story films. So let's have a quick look at sci-fi and fantasy because you know how much I love me sci-fi and I love me fantasy. So this year we had Krull. Now when I was a kid, I must make it clear, when this came out and I saw it at the cinema, I was obsessed with it. There was there was that star thing that he throws and like it was it was set on a different planet with a prince going to rescue a princess from the beast who lives in a dark black fortress and uh, are we are we are we sensing a bit of a whiff of Star Wars within this? Possibly. It was directed by Peter Yates, and the fantasy swashbuckler effect of it was was thrilling and engaging as a kid. I made the mistake in my early twenties of going back and revisiting this film and hoping that it'd still stand the test of time. It didn't. It is truly a dreadful film. It is utter garbage. This is one of those films that, when you're a child, you can really embrace, but if you're an adult, no. It's not good at all. There are still some die-hard fans out there who insist that this is a great film. Just like there's people who think Ready Player One is a good book. It isn't. You're just remembering the nostalgia that it's tapping into. Don't watch Krull if you've never watched it. And if you have, my sympathies. Uh, Return of the Jedi came out this year, so that kind of makes up for Krull. Return of the Jedi introduced us to the Ewoks. So, actually, Krull doesn't seem that bad at this point in time. No. Let's be honest, Return of the Jedi is still a great film. If you ignore the fact that the cuddly teddy bears kind of dilute it towards the end, it still has enough action and energy in there. And there's the final confrontation between Luke and Vader. There's the Emperor there manipulating everything. It's absolutely smashing a film. It is well and truly up there. Most memorably with Return of the Jedi... It introduced us to Jabba's throne room, which was a marvellous creation. And the Sarlacc pit, and it, it, it gave us Boba Fett back briefly before he proves how inept he actually was as a bounty hunter. And you start to wonder, why is there such a fascination about Boba Fett? I really don't get it, because he seems pretty ineffective throughout. Anyway, Return of the Jedi, marvellous entry. Not as good as Empire Strikes Back was, obviously, but still makes for a perfect trilogy we had war games came out this year which saw matthew broderick playing david who was a kid who unwittingly almost starts world war three when he starts a game of global thermonuclear war with a military computer this was a film that tapped into the early days of like dial-up modems and hooking your phone up and connecting to use nets and things like that and it played with it well and it it's got a charm and it's a good thriller and it's it actually stands up quite well today i mean obviously the internet today is completely different and you know playing thermonuclear war with a computer would only take about five minutes and we're all dead but if you recognize it as being set in the time that it was made it works and it really does work and matthew broderick holds the screen so well this was the film that really put him on the map and twilight zone the movie came out this year now, Twilight Zone had been a series decades before, and this movie was uh, was tapping into the anthology films, which were starting to become a thing in the early 80s. And John Landis, Steven Spielberg, Joe Dante, and George Miller all offered up a story each to put this anthology together. The first one sees Vic Morrow play a racist who's transformed into a Jew during World War II, Second story sees Scatman Crothers teaching old people at a retirement home to be young again. The third one sees Kathleen Quinlan as a teacher who meets a young boy who isn't quite what he seems. And the final one, the most memorable one, John Lithgow becomes William Shatner. By that I mean that John Lithgow stars in the role that William Shatner made famous in the original Twilight Zone in the classic tale of something on the wing. There's some one on the wing. Marvellous. Absolutely marvellous. Even though, you know, 
one or two of the stories aren't quite as good. They, they are still really solid, and the ones around it really lift it. Twilight Zone the movie is a great anthology film that is well worth tapping into today. And Twilight Zone is, has made multiple resurgences since. I mean, in the 90s there was another series... And we've now got a new series, which uh, is led by Jordan Peele. Twilight Zone will always be around in one shape or form. And this was the way that it shaped itself in the early 80s. Moving from Twilight Zone straight into horror. Now, horror got a good look in this year, which is probably why there were so many R ratings. First of all, we had Psycho 2. Now, whereas most sequels kind of get tired... Psycho 2 is well worth checking out. If you've never seen it, go check it out. It's a solid sequel which sees Norman Bates released from the mental institution that he's been committed to after the previous film ended. And he attempts to get his life back on track and reopen the Bates Motel. However, memories of the events and of his mother continue to haunt him. And something, something might be going wrong. Well worth checking out. I'm not going to talk any more about it because I don't want to spoil anything. But if you've never seen Psycho 2, you are missing out on a gem of a film. Uh, for a film that you shouldn't go back and watch, and if you've never seen it, just continue not seeing it. Jaws 3, or as it was released, Jaws 3D. Because it utilised the gimmick in order to sell. And this was back in the days when it was like the red and blue glasses um, kind of 3D and I remember seeing this at the cinema and oh it was terrible I, I mean the 3D was bad kind of effective for the time but it used yeah it was things like things with like fly out towards the screen there was a, the, the typical I've got a syringe I'm got to fill it and then I'm got to point it at the screen and spray it out at your face mm, gimmicks 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 the story saw marine bi biologists finding a vengeful shark attacking a water park and it's as bad as it sounds not worth seeing not even a, as a morbid curiosity it's a bad film uh, video drone Cronen one of cronenberg's finest as far as i'm concerned it's a body horror which sees james woods which that's a body horror in itself these days as a tv president who's seeking new programming to draw in new audiences and he finds a channel that is devoted to gratuitous gore, torture and punishment. And things begin to get warped. It's typically Cronenberg. It's it's got satirical aspects to that to it. And it it plays with perceptions a lot. It's a cracking film, well worth checking out. We had a triple whammy of Stephen King. Now, people these days, in this day and age, with so many Stephen King films coming out at least once a year, say, oh, there's too much Stephen King, isn't there? There's never too much Stephen King. And 1983 gave us three Stephen King films. First of all, we have John Carpenter's Christine. Adapted from the book of the same name, it sees a car with a mind of its own find a new owner who becomes obsessed with it and then people start to die mysteriously around the car. Marvellous film. Carpenter on form with his direction. Memorable moments and a really, really good adaptation. There's elements of the book that are missing. There's supernatural elements that are absent. But you don't mind because you get all that you need from this film. We had Killer Dogs in Cujo. Again, adapted from the book by Stephen King. And it's a dog gets rabies and goes nuts and terrorises a mother and her son. Uh, famously, there was a change from one element of the book for the film. I'm not going to tell you what it is in case you've never seen it because it's a nice little surprise. It's not a great film. It doesn't stand up well. But when I was young and I watched this, it made me absolutely petrified of any dogs with slobber drooling from its lips. Seriously, this made me fear that everything had rabies. And then we got the best Stephen King adaptation of all time. Christopher Walken in Stephen King's Dead Zone. What an absolute gem of a film. Walken is put into a coma and when he wakes up, his life has changed around him. However, he's discovered that he can have visions of the future or a potential future 
and it becomes obsessed with trying to stop the new rising wannabe president played by Martin Sheen from gaining power because he has a vision that he will destroy the world absolutely brilliant tense well cast Walken is on fire through this film he was perfectly cast as Johnny and I'd say it's possibly one of his best outings as well as one of the best Stephen King films of all time from horror let's calm down with a bit of comedy so this year we saw Steve Martin in The Man With Two Brains playing Do Dr. Hoffafarar who's in an unhappy marriage but falls in love with a brain in a jar it sounds daft it is daft and it's absolutely fun it's a thrill to watch and this is one that I've revisited multiple times and I still laugh this is Steve Martin on uh, he, he was really on form at this point in his career and it really plays to all of his strengths we had the Pythons returned with Monty Python's Meaning of Life. After the previous film, Life of Brian gave a structured story. Now they're back to sketches, each conveying a different element of the stages of life. Some of the elements hit, some of them miss badly. However, it is most notable for two songs that it gave the world. First of all, the song and dance number Every Sperm is Sacred, which is towards the beginning of the film. And then you've got the Universe song later on in the film. If you're a fan of Python, definitely want to watch. If you're not a fan of Python, this ain't going to change your mind. National Lampoon's Vacation. Now, I've got a love for the National Lampoon's Vacation series. Every single one of the vacation films has some enjoyment to them. And this one, where it all started, Chevy Chase, directed by Harold Ramis, is a fun cross-America road movie. The character of Clark Griswold is just so perfectly stumblingly comic that I, I, I just I think that it was Chevy Chase's finest role and it was followed with sequels down the road and in recent years we had uh, Ed Helms fronting Vacation which was a modern day sequel for definite if you've never seen National Lampoon's Vacation is one to put high up on that list of things to get around to things to ignore now I've extolled my love of the Smoking the Bandit films over the past few episodes of this Smoking the Bandit 1 and 2 directed by Hal Needham and starring Burt Reynolds were absolutely fantastic so it comes to Smoking the Bandit 3 and oh this was this was disappointment this was severe disappointment I remember renting this out from the video shop and watching it and wondering whether they put the wrong tape in because the bandit isn't really in it um, instead Smokey is the bandit yes Gleason's sheriff is now hauling cargo as part of a bet. It simply rehashes events of the previous film, and without the charisma of Reynolds or the action direction of Needham, it's left lacking, and it, it's not worth watching. It's worth avoiding completely. It's worth burning. Just put it into a tip and burn it. Rounding up comedy, we had Trading Places. This is a fabulous John Landis comedy. Sees two millionaire brothers wage a small bet that the fortunes could be switched between that of a wealthy investor played by Dan Aykroyd and a street con artist played by Eddie Murphy. It's charming, it's fun, it's engaging and it, 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 it's just one of those perfectly affable, likeable films. It uses the stock market and as anything that uses the stock market in a film you have no idea what it's going on about but that doesn't matter because it's the charisma of the players involved that carry it through to the end great film well worth a revisit well worth watching for the first time if you've never seen it before and also this year the man of steel flew once more in superman 3 <sighs> what now let's just be clear here at least it wasn't Superman 4 Quest for Peace, which we'll get to in a future episode. But Superman 3 is not a good film. Richard Pryor is a computer genius, teams up with a wealthy entrepreneur to realise his intentions. Superman plans to stop him, but something changes in the big S when a, a warped kryptonite is presented to him. Reading on the making of this film, 
Richard Pryor doesn't come across very well. He's not very funny in it. And his lines are, are rather laboured. And apparently it was because when he was hired, they expected him to ad-lib things and improvise around things. But he actually turned around when they asked him to play around with things and pointed out that they're paying him to act, not to write. Unless they pay him to what write, he's just going to say what's on the page. And so it doesn't feel like it's a Richard Pryor film. Uh, Christopher Reeve is still fantastic in it. You know, don't get me wrong. He puts, even even in Quest for Peace, which we'll get to later, he always delivered to the best that he could with the material. He's me- engaging. He's memorable. There are a few moments and a few highlights within the film that are worth checking out. The The battle between his, his Clark and Superman, represented in a junkyard fight, is absolutely comic book perfect. It is a brilliant representation of him struggling with his inner demons. But the rest of the film around it is a shambles. It's playing onto the whole hacking aspect. It's playing on the rise of computer technologies. And it tries to jokingly insert a flippancy in there. Including a, a, a attacking Superman with missile sequence. Which is done via representation on what looks like a really bad video game that thankfully never came out. It, it, it's not the worst Superman film, but after Superman 1 and 2 really, really stand the test of time, this is one that just doesn't stand up at all. Disappointing, and as a huge fan of Superman, a huge fan of the big S, I've got nothing to recommend with it. And on that depressing note, I'll quickly mention the films that I've not seen from this year that I really should have. So we've got Risky Business. Yes, I've not seen Risky Business. I'm aware of it. I'm aware of the importance of it. Never seen it. Rumblefish. Never seen Rumblefish. Most people are probably going to scream at this monitor now when I say this one. Never seen Scarface. Genuinely, never seen it. I I think that I pretty much seen everything that I need to of it because there's so many clips that have been overused throughout my life but I've never seen the film in one go The Keep is another one that I've had recommended to me and I've never gotten around to and Flashdance so uh, a few iconic films within there that I've not actually got around to and uh, I'm not ashamed of it because I will get round to them eventually maybe who knows have I missed anything else out is there anything from 1983 that it would be on your list that I've not mentioned? If so, you know what to do. Comments below, pop it down there. Anyway, thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, you know the trick. And I'll see you when we get to 1984. And trust me, it's going to be a good one.